Hi, I'm Ken DeLuca. I'm the Education Director here at the School of Horology for the NAWCC. I've been on staff for almost two years now and I've gotten a lot of requests about distance learning and how to do a general movement servicing on a clock. And that's what we're going to do today. So welcome. Let's get started. I have quite a bit of storage of material here that I'm trying to get organized. So as you can see, every time we handle a clock these days, we try to label what the clock is. This is the tambour department, and we can see that we have a number of Seth Thomas uh, sessions, Gilberts, and so forth. And on this side over here is our black mantle collection of clocks. And again, a number of different clocks uh, by different manufacturers, all part of the magnificent seven clockmakers up that were in Connecticut. So what we're trying to do is find a clock movement clock, actual clock here that we can have to do a general movement servicing on. Oh, what about this one down here? So this is the clock we're going to perform a general movement servicing to. It's a time-only clock. It only has one winding arbor. All it does is keep time. It's a wall clock, and it's made by the Waterbury Company out of Connecticut. And we'll take a look in the catalog to see if we can try to date this. Somebody went and painted this white. I'm not sure what color it would have been originally, but it looks like it's been repainted, and you can see paint peeling off. But we'll look at the catalog and see what colors they came in and about when they were made. Before I start working on a clock, I always like to find out as much information as I can. A Trandulai has made up a number of uh, clock catalog books like this one that we have here for Waterbury. Uh, he, he's made them for all the Connecticut makers and some others. And if I look through this book of his, um, I find that on page 149 is the closest example of what I can find related to this clock. Um, I think it's pronounced uh, Dynanti number two. It's an eight-day time-only movement. Uh, the dial is a little bit smaller. Instead of a six-inch metal dial, it is a uh, five-and-a-half-inch, and I think this one is paper and not metal. The height is about the same, about 12 and seven-eighth inches high. But as you can see, there's an octagonal surround around the dial, uh, as well as ours being round. And again, um, so we're not sure exactly if this is the, uh, the model that we have here, but that's as close as we can get. These were made um, circa 1929, uh, could have come out a little bit sooner, could have stayed in production for a few more years, that type of thing, we're really not sure. Uh, there's a white one with a blue border. Uh, this one was repainted. So uh, was it white with a blue border? We'll never know. But back in 1929, this sold for $12.15. It always intrigues me when clocks come out, 1929, uh, what was happening at that time towards the end of the year was the Great Depression, the great stock market crash. So that's something to keep in mind. So like I said, um, those books give us an approximate date. And additionally, there's a little bit of history there, in this case, about the Waterbury Company. So here's the clock that we're going to be working on. Again, this is a wall clock, wooden wall clock. I'm going to remove this little um, uh, tag here I have had for this one. And I'm going to take out from the bottom here the key, the winding key that we looked at earlier, and the pendulum bob. And again, very important, just keep reminding yourself, whenever you move a clock, make sure the bob is removed from the clock pendulum rod. Otherwise, you stand a good chance of damaging, bending, breaking the suspension spring, and then you have to replace that. So always good practice, take the pendulum bob off before you do anything with a clock. Okay, so now we're going to uh, take uh, the dial, the hands and the dial uh, off of this clock so we can get a look at the movement. Uh, with these types of dials and the bezel, as it's called, uh, you do have to be cautious because sometimes that glass is just barely hanging in there and it can easily drop out. This one seems to be pretty, pretty much uh, where it needs to be and um, so we're good with that. Uh, 
So the first thing we need to do is take the hands off. Now there's usually a taper pin that's in there, or sometimes there's a hand nut. This one has a hand nut. Now um, I might need a pair of pliers, but let me just see if I, by finger tightening, I can remove that hand nut. Yep, that did come right off. So we can remove the hand nut. Um, once you start dealing with these little pieces, parts, it's always good to use a container to put them in so you don't lose them. So I uh, strongly encourage you to do that. So with the hand nut off, we'll take the minute hand off. Like so. And then we'll take the hour hand off. Now, as I take a look here, I've got one, two, three, four wood screws that hold the dial to the case. So let me get a small screwdriver. I've got two types here, a smaller one and a larger one. Let's start with the larger one and see if I can get those screws out. And that size fits okay. So there's one. You're going to need to study this because when you take the last screw out, you will, of course, remove everything holding that dial in place. And one more. Now, whenever I remove a dial from the movement, I always look on the back of it because it's amazing how many clock makers would have put the date that say something like lubricated or oiled. Uh, sometimes they'll put a name, initials. Sometimes they put the um, uh, weather, what the weather is for that particular day that they were working on it. This one doesn't have anything like that. So we'll just put that safely aside. So now we're looking at, for the first time, the movement that is inside of this little, little case here, this little bitty wall clock. Generally, they're held in with little feet, as it's called, with wooden screws. And that's what we have here. As I take a look around, I see there's four wooden screws holding this movement, a little bit loose right here, but holding this movement into the case. So let me remove those four screws. One, two, three, and four. So let's see if I can lift this out now. go. Be careful of the crutch rod. Sometimes that gets in the way. But as you can see here, we have, uh, we have our movement removed from the case. Again, with the screws, make sure you get all four of them. Put them in your little container so they don't get lost. And there's one more down in here. Now let's talk a little bit about cases for a moment. When I get a case in, when I get a clock in to work on, <clears throat> I establish with the customer exactly what's to be done with the case. And what I mean by that is generally, I'll just clean the glass. Because to me, if you start doing anything else, you start getting into a restoration project. This clock conceivably was made in 1929, nearly a hundred years ago. I think a clock should look like it's got a hundred years of age on it. So I don't start polishing things, I don't start doing things like that until I clear it with the client, with the customer to make sure they're okay with it. As I said, this poor, this poor clock here has been repainted. 
at some point. And again, I'm not a, into refinishing wood and stuff like that. So I'm just going to leave this as it is. But that's something to talk about with the client, with the owner. So let's put that aside in a safe spot. At this stage, it's probably a good time to do two things. One is have your cell phone ready because you may want to take a picture of what you have. If you do take a picture, take a picture from the top, from the back, from the sides, very top, and very bottom. Especially when you get to more complicated movements, having a picture, having pictures, is a real good thing. I do that for almost every movement that I work with. However, I may not even look at the images. Just knowing they're there is enough. I also encourage you at this point in time to come up with a bench book. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I recommend the spiral bound because it takes up less space on the bench. Pencil or pen is fine. But again, all we're trying to do is make some general notes of what you find with this movement when you're working on it. So I'd write down the date, I'd write down Waterbury, time only, and that'll get us started. Okay, so at this stage now, what we need to do is probably the most important thing for safety for you, the clockmaker, as well as the safety for the clock itself, and that is to contain the energy in the mainspring. If you have a weight-driven clock, all you have to do is remove the weight or weights, and then all that energy is dissipated. But when you have a mainspring like this one, all that energy is there, and it's going to want to expand at, at all costs. Now what we want to do is use something called a mainspring clamp, sometimes called a keeper, sometimes called a C-clamp for obvious reasons, to contain this mainspring. There's the round style. You can see from the edge here, it is a round style. And now recently they've come out with a flat style that looks like this one. These are a little bit more costly. These used to come with new mainsprings when you purchased them. That's not the case anymore. Typically today they come with a wire wrapped around them. And I've been even seeing some plastic zip ties these days retaining mainsprings. None of those can work to retain the power, control the power, uh, contain the power for the mainspring. So you could use either of these. These round ones can slip off and be a problem. But the flat ones, once they get in position, they pretty well stay where they need to be. And I, in fact, like to use these a little bit more often when I'm doing striking clocks, when I'm doing chiming clocks, because they take up less surface area than the round ones. So we're going to use a flat one today. So in order to do that, I'm going to need to wind this mainspring up. I'll use the key that came with the movement. See, it's starting to close in on itself. I need to be at least three quarters of the way, sometimes a little bit more, in order to put that mainspring clamp on. So let's see how this works now. I'm going to lift this up and see how best I can slide this in in order to contain the mainspring. Okay, I got that. Nothing is in the way. So I've got that closed up enough. I've got the mainspring clamp in place surrounding the mainspring. Make sure you don't wrap it around another arbor of the wheels that we'll talk about in a little bit. Make sure it doesn't go to a post that may contain the mainspring from expanding into the movement. Those you see typically on the eight day time strike movements. So I think we have that where we need it to be. So now we need another special tool. And that special tool is called a letdown key. One of the first tools you'll need to purchase if you're gonna be doing 
clock repair, especially with mainsprings. Here's a uncontained mainspring, and here's a contained mainspring with a C-clamp, mainspring clamp on it. But you need to use a letdown key in order to let the energy out of these before you take the plates apart. So you'll find one of the keys that go right on that winding square. Those are too small. And this one fits just right, just a little bit of clearance there. And then that goes into the handle. Notice the handle is nice and smooth. So unlike a screwdriver, so you get torque, so you can turn it to tighten or untighten, this one is supposed to slide right in your hand. And this is what we use to let the power down, hence a letdown key, from the mainspring before you take the plates apart. Okay, so we have the mainspring clamp in place, ready to go. I've explained what a letdown key is, and I'll be demonstrating how to use that in a moment. The next thing we need to do is get inside towards where the click and the click spring is. And again, once we get this apart, I'll be able to show you that and explain that in a little bit more detail. But what I need to do now is remove the click spring from the click. So I'm going to look inside here. I can see the click spring and I'm going to remove the click spring from holding the click in place. This one is a little bit buried, so I've got to be a little bit more patient and get to it. I might use a screwdriver on this one. And there we go. So I remove the click spring from the click. Now what I'm going to do is try to let the power down. And in order to do that, I need to grab this movement good and tight. I can't have this spinning around on a control. I need my letdown key in position. I'm holding the mainspring clamp at about midway on the mainspring. And what I'm going to do is give this a little bit of a wind to kick the click on a position. And then I'm going to gently release my grasp on the letdown key until all that energy comes out of the mainspring. Okay, so what we just did is we were able to contain the power of the mainspring. So all the energy has been removed from that mainspring and there's no energy left in the gear train or the wheel train of this clock. It's all contained by that mainspring clamp. That is the most important thing that you can do for your safety and for the safety of the clock. If that energy comes onto that mainspring, suddenly, catastrophically, it could cut your skin, it could break a knuckle, it could break a finger. Likewise, for the movement, if that energy is released so suddenly, you can bend an arbor, you can break teeth off, and we'll be looking at all of these pieces, parts, before too long. So right now, this movement has no energy left in it because the mainspring clamp is doing its job. So what I would do at this point in time, I'm going to take out the the um, pendulum rod, which in this particular model of Waterbury, it's got two bends in it. It's held in position by a little piece of wire here. So I'm gonna see if I can get a pair of needle nose on there in order to remove that piece of wire so I can remove that. There we go. All 
Okay. And that little piece of wire did break on me. So that's something you might put down in your in your little book on this particular clock. We'll need to put a new wire in. That's a very common thing to happen. So now I can slide this out because on this part I have a very delicate suspension spring. And I don't want to bend that. I don't want to break that. There's the hole where that little wire went through. And I want to keep this as intact and carefully put aside as possible. So we have the pendulum rod suspension spring removed. Uh, we still have our crutch in place here. And that uh, we're going to deal with that later because the escapement is between the plates on this particular movement. Oftentimes, kitchen clocks, parlor clocks, the escapement's external to the, um, to the plates on the inside. So at this stage, what we're going to do is remove these four pillar nuts, as they're called. Older movements will have tapered pins in their pillar uh, pillars that are holding the plates together. These are nuts. So again, that tells me that this is a newer movement. And again, that kind of verifies to me that the 1929 date is probably a good one. You really would like to use a nut driver set that looks like this. If you were to take pliers in here for these nuts, you're sure to scratch the plates. And you really want to avoid that. Even though this movement has been mass produced probably in the millions or even tens of millions, uh, we just don't want to introduce any kinds of damage to these um, plates um, as we can. So using the uh, nuts, even little bitty wrenches, uh, that would work as well. Well, let's see if I have a nut driver size that'll fit these. And that one just, that one will work. Doesn't quite fit on. I think this one's going to be too big. Yep, that one's too big. So we are going to go with this size. And I'll put the handle on. And remember, whenever you use a tool, you're magnifying the strength of your hands. So what I'm trying to say there is if you, when you put these nuts back on, if you overly tighten them, you're very likely to strip out threads. So be careful of that when you're using any kind of additional types of tools when you're working with clocks. Okay, they're all loosened. And let me see if I can take these off. Some may come off by hand. Some are pretty well uh, there's a lot of debris, old lubricant in there. Put those in your little container. And we'll get all of these pillar nuts removed. So now we have the four pillar nuts removed. And this is what I kind of tell people who take my workshops. This is the moment of truth. Because this is when we're going to separate the plates. And when you start getting complex clocks, like time strike clocks, chiming clocks, clocks that have other complications associated with them, um, having a picture with your phone uh, or a camera, making some basic notes are going to be very, very important. I'm going to put down, so I don't forget because I don't know when I'll finish this job up, the wire for the suspension spring. broke. So that's like one repair. That's going to be something I need to deal with down the road. I just made a note of that. So now I'm going to separate the plates and I'm going to have wheels and arbors and stuff go all different directions. And again, my escapement is between the plates. So I'm going to have, um, uh, I'm going to have that little added thing to deal with as well. But let's separate the plates now and see usually there's a little bit of energy left in the movement from the mainspring not much sometimes just a little bit and you see a little bit of energy come out now at that particular moment in time this escape wheel popped out i'm going to deal with that in a moment but i'm going to lift straight up and i'm going to put wheels back into place where they came out of. 
So that one was there. I believe this escape wheel was like so. My escapement was here. And as you can see now, I've got that wheel in the wrong way. So I'm going to flip this around because it would have to be in this way for the escapement to do its thing. This wheel pulled out. So I'm going to put this back in where it belongs. And everything looks about right so far. And this is driven by this wheel. So let's take this away. You want to make sure all of these wheels. Yep, indeed, go back together the way they should. And there we go. OK, so we separated the plates. And it's very important at this stage to make sure you know which wheel goes where and how it's positioned. Now, when this movement came apart, many of the wheels dropped down on me. So I had to be very cautious to understand fully how they go back together. And that's where it comes to using our notebook here for a reference. So what I'm going to do is make a little sketch. I've got the basic outline of the movement, kind of a square, kind of a rectangle. I've got a square, there's my winding square, and this mainspring loops around that pillar and goes like this. And this wheel, or this gear, is what we call as T1, time wheel number one. Some people call them gears, but most all clockmakers call them wheels, so that's what we're going to call them. From this point, the train, as it's called, goes up to here. And this is T2. Now, I add a little note here, because T2, as we look at the movement, has the brass wheel up. So this is a little added reminder to me that when this wheel and when this whole movement goes back together, T2 must go with the brass facing upwards. T1 is easy to recognize because it's got the winding square coming out the front. Now, with this particular movement, T3 stayed attached to the movement, front plate. And so therefore, this came out and knocked some other wheels out. But this all stays together here when it's going to be put back together and when it comes apart. So that's T3. Now, as I look at that one, I'm going to say brass up. But again, there's really nowhere, nowhere else this can really be placed except in the condition and position it's in. And from that wheel, we work our way over to this direction. And this is T4. And if you take a look at that, brass is down and our pinion is up. At first, I thought this pinion went to this wheel but in fact, it's going to T3, which is sometimes called the center arbor. And then lastly, T4 over here drives the escapement wheel, which is T5. Brass up on this particular wheel here, and that's the escapement wheel. We'll talk about each of these different pieces, parts in more detail once we get them out of the movement and once we get them cleaned up.
as you're making notes, it's always best to put down more information than less. So for example, uh, this is the escape wheel. So I'll make a note of that. T5. T4 has many, many teeth. So I'm just making a record of that. T2 is the largest wheel after the great wheel where the mainspring is located. I put the escapement in just to show you relative position, but I'm going to remove that now. And needless to say, this crutch wire here, crutch loop, has to go to the front. If you can see here, that's quite dirty, quite worn. So I'm taking my wheels off now and taking a quick look. We have to polish pivots. But first thing, we've got to clean this thoroughly before we do anything. Just seeing what we have as these wheels come out of the movement itself. See there's some liquid lubricant on there. And this is the great wheel that also contains the mainspring. And there's a tremendous amount of energy stored up in there. And we'll handle the great wheel separately because we're going to be using something called a mainspring winder. So we can safely remove this, get it cleaned, put the mainspring clamp back on it, secure it when we do put the movement back together. So at this stage, we have what we might call the back plate or the bottom plate completely disassembled. And now when we look to the front plate, I've got to make some decisions here as to what I want to do and maybe don't want to do. You can see made in the USA by Waterbury Clock Company. Number eight refers to a little bit of the pendulum and the pendulum rod, but also how this clock was made and what cases it went into. So that number isn't really a big help to you, uh, but sometimes if you go to the catalogs, you can find some information about it. This is where the escapement goes. I'm not going to remove that screw because it was probably in the right place. But I do want to take this apart a bit here and be able to get some of this apart so I can get it better cleaned. Okay, so now I've got some interesting stuff going on here with the center arbor, uh, the hour tube or hour pipe, as well as the minute wheel. So obviously I have a screw assembly here, so I'm going to take that screw assembly off. I'm going to, with my notes here, just kind of make a little bit of a diagram here. And this wheel goes underneath here. And then I've got the screw here. And this is where the shaft comes up for the minute hand. So let's take this screw off here. and see what we can remove. So that screw has a shoulder on it and a washer. So I'm just going to make a note here. Screw, brass, washer. And then that minute hand can be extracted. Pardon me, that, that minute wheel can be extracted. The hour tube then comes off. And now we need to make a decision because this minute arbor is held on by that pinion. And some of those pinions are put on extremely tight, almost to the point where you do more damage trying to remove it than leaving it together. So I'm going to see how this cleans up. I'm going to look at wear and so forth. But I think for right now, I'm going to leave that pinion on rather than trying to remove it take it off, which can be a big process with the length of that arbor there. And I think that's going to be the best solution for this one. Um, as I tip this in various directions, I don't see a lot of wear. I think my ultrasonic cleaner is going to get most of that debris out. So I think we're going to be okay with that. With all this information you have in your book now, You've got some information for putting it back together. And so now what we're going to need to do is take this over to the cleaner.